I am excited about this week. We're kind of at the midway point of our, of our, our walk through the 23rd Psalm. We're going to be in verse 3 today. So if you have your Bible, you can go to Psalm 23 and look at verse 3. Um, and, and it's just, it's, I'm excited because as I was digging into all of this uh, for the message today, it just, it, it, well, it was exciting because I just began to see the, the process of God. Okay, I, at least there's one of you that's like, yeah, let's see the process of God this morning. Let, let's do a real quick recap, though, from where we have been. David is writing this psalm from the perspective of the relationship between a shepherd and his sheep, but really he's writing it from the perspective of a sheep. And the conclusion thus far is simple. Jesus is my provider and protector. Even when it appears that I am missing something, I miss absolutely nothing. I lack nothing. Last week we saw that he commands intimacy. Intimacy is not an option. It is a command. And closeness and the closeness of being in his bosom where he knows me by name and in return his voice and face are the only things I will turn to. And I trust him to sustain me with the endless supply of everything that I need to function properly in life and godliness. Now that's a fairly brief summation of where we've been, what we've kind of heard. And I simply need to drink. Because the supply is always there. There's never a drought of his supply. It is always there. And I simply need to drink of his supply. And so with that, I, I want to, uh, I guess from, chap, from verse 3, jump into uh, where we're going to go with this because all of these things are building us up to a place of relationship and understanding of, of, of the purpose of Jesus being here and, and the relationship that we now have with him. And so uh, in God's plan of revealing himself as a shepherd, in his plan of revealing himself as a provider and a protector, in his plan... Jesus uh, as being that intimate relationship that we need to have in, in light of his supply. There's a drive and a direction that we're going. And here's, here's the big idea for you this morning. It is very simple. It's God's plan leads to full restoration. Listen, God doesn't want to just halfway restore you. It's full restoration, completed restoration in your life. So Psalm 23 verse 3 says very simply, He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Notice there's a period after He restores my soul. This is a, this is a complete thought and it is a thought that David writes as this is a non-negotiable. This is what he does. If there was anything you needed to know about the Lord, if there's anything you need to know about relationship with God, it's that He is a restorer. And He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. So number one, we're going to look at He restores this morning. And I'm thankful that God is a full service kind of God. Y'all know what full service is. Y'all remember the full service gas stations? I don't, but if some of you do, you can tell me all about them. Uh, but the, he doesn't leave us at any point in the process of figuring things out for ourselves. Okay, He does not leave us anywhere in the process of figuring things out for ourselves. Listen, if you are having to figure things out, then you're not following where he's taking you. Because he has the answers lined out for you at all times. He's never leaving you. He's never forsaking you. And if you have to question where you should go next, you have not been listening. That's, that's, a, that's a line not drawn in the sand. That's a line that is drawn in eternity. 
So he doesn't leave us at any point in the process to figure things out. But he's made provision every step of the way on the journey of transformation into the image of Jesus. The, the good thing about our relationship with God and, and, is that we don't have to look like ourselves. We get to look like Jesus. And, it's, and I, I would say it's not even that we get to, it's we want to look like Jesus, I want to be a son of God, not the son of God, a son of God. How do I look like a son of God? I am conforming to the image of his only begotten son. And as I am conforming to the image of his only begotten son, then that means that everything merited in the relationship between the father and Jesus, I now obtain. I hope you enjoyed that because it only gets better from here. So how awesome is this that the word restore is very, it means this uh, very powerful word. I, I was thinking, okay, what does, what does he mean to restore? And restore in the context uh, of, its, of its Hebrew roots and all of that. And, and not to tell you what the word is because I can't hardly pronounce any of the Hebrew words. But just so you understand, here is how this word restore is defined. To make a linear motion back to a point previously departed. In other words, if I were to break it down in a more simple definition, it would be that he rewinds the clock. Okay, that wasn't powerful enough for you. Okay. Um, well, I can't say it any more powerfully than he... Wouldn't any of you like for the clock to be turned back just a little bit? Any, anybody have those moments where you just wish you were a little bit taller, wish you were a baller? No, I'm kidding. You're not, 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 not that. But, but you just wish for a moment that, you know, I wish at the age of 48 that I had an 18-year-old's body. My 18-year-old body, not someone else's, mine, Okay. The, that, that highly athletic, that highly, you know, all of those things at the age of 18. I kind of wish that God would allow the clock to turn back to that point for me in a physical sense. Because I would feel a whole lot better, I think. But what he does is he makes this linear motion. That means across the line of your life, he makes a linear motion across the line of your life to the place where you departed from him. Now, here's what you need to understand about this. The powerful lesson is that this is for us all. And, and when he turns back the clock, it is, it, it is well, I don't want to jump past this information because uh, I want to share it with you this way. You know that Stacy and I, we love to watch shows. I mean, if you don't know by now, you don't know me. That as an empty nester, I have my wife, I have a TV, and I have internet. So I have everything that I need to survive. Um, and, and so we like to watch these shows, and, and we watch, we love to watch restoration shows, especially automobile restoration shows. Uh, because these guys, and this one in particular was called Rust Valley, all right, and it was in Canada. All right, so just take it for what you will. I know we're here in Texas. We don't have a whole lot that we can relate to with Canadians, but enjoy. Because this guy had like a graveyard of cars. All right, he had acres and acres of cars. And he would go out when, because he, 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 uh, he was a, a, well, he would restore automobiles for other people. But if he ever needed that, that, uh, just extra cash, he would go out into his backyard, basically, and he would find some old rusted clunker, and, and you know, from the, from the muscle car days, we're talking the 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, that, that era, maybe a little bit earlier if he's got uh, a car, and he would, he would hook that thing up to his, to, to his tow truck, and he would pull that thing into his garage, and, and he'd start looking at it, and he'd, he, he'd start messing with it and poking on it and pulling uh, different things and, and, and trying to get the, the beasts to start and all of that stuff and, and determine how much it was going to cost to do. But we loved watching the process because he would, he would take this thing back down to its guts, to the shell. He would remove the rust. 
and the rough edges. He would go in and he would rebuild the motors with classic parts that he could find that were still on the market to buy. Uh, or he would make and fabricate parts. And he would do all of these things because his goal was to present a vehicle that was as if it was fresh off the showroom floor. You all know what fresh off the showroom floor means. It means that no one has ever driven it. It means it came in on the fa off the factory line on a truck. They dropped it off. They probably started it to drive the tenth of a mile into the showroom and left it there with a price tag on it. No one has touched it. It is unadulterated. Nothing has harmed it. And this is the process of restoration that we're talking about when it comes to he restores my soul. He takes you all the way back, not just to when you left, but he repairs the breach all the way back to when Adam left. He rewinds the clock back to before Adam fell. You see, in order for us to be reconciled, it can't be when you turned away from God. He has to get us back to the place of before Adam did. Because when Adam fell, we all fell. Whether you like it or not, you have inherited sin because of Adam. Okay, so, so in order for God to fully restore right relationship with man, he had to take us all the way back to before Adam fell, where they could walk in the garden in the cool of the day. Well, I don't know what it's like to walk in a garden in the cool of the day right now. We're here in Texas, and even when it's 87 degrees and it's not 100, it still feels like it's 150. So I don't know what the cool of the day really feels like, and I'm not up when the cool of the day actually is working for us. But he restores us back to that place of before Adam fell. He can only do that through sacrifice. He can only do that through Jesus. So understand this. The process of restoration is to get you back into a right relationship, not with where you left, but with where Adam left. Because in order for you to truly be called son, it's not just that he grafts you in at the point of your leaving. He has to graft you back into the point of first creation. I know that's a little deep for us to think about this morning, but that's for the theologians that are in here who think that they're deep and want to go deeper. So that's for you to ponder. But for every one of us, it's to understand that he takes us back to the unadulterated showroom floor in our relationships with him. To me, that's powerful. Because I know me, and I know you, right? We always play the guilt game, don't we? Oh, he has forgiven me, but don't you remember? Oh, he's forgiven my sin, and I'm cleansed, but don't you remember? Because I do. See, in order to get you reconciled to him, he has to erase the memory, which has to go before Adam fell to that peaceful relationship of closeness with him. Yes, he forgets your sin, but it's because he's reconnected us from the point of Adam's failure. I'm going to say that until you all get it and the, big, the, the light comes on so that you understand just how powerful restoration really is. He takes you back to the first relationship. That's good, ladies and gentlemen. That's that... It, that integral place of where you can truly call on the Lord and know that he is there and he can walk with you and he will walk with you. He walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. So he takes me back to the place where there can be no other owner. And he takes me back to the place where I don't even own myself. And he takes me back to the place where I'm not even in, con where, where I, while I have semblance of control, that control is now um, surrendered to the relationship that I had previously and have always had with him from the very beginning and had access to from the very beginning. God is good. He doesn't just halfway restore you. Huh. So know this, that the process is hard at times. Here's the thing about restoration that we don't, that we love when we watch it, but we hate when it's being done on ourselves. Because in order for there to be true restoration in your lives, yes, Jesus begins it, and, and we, we even talked about this on Wednesday night, the process of sanctification is immediate and 
continuous. So we understand that when I, ex- when I declare Jesus Christ as Lord, I am now in the place of being sanctified. I am cleansed. I am forgiven. I am whole. But I'm also going through the process of that being made whole. And that's the painful place that we don't like. Because that requires that I be absolutely naked before God. So that he can identify the weak spots, the rust spots. So that he can identify that what's working and what's not working in me and how it can change. So that he is able to make the repairs the way he's supposed to make the repairs to get me back to the place that I need to be. The craziest thing uh, about working on uh, in, in this show, the, the Rust Valley show, is that when they bring in these cars and those shells and they go through it with a fine tooth comb and they find every weak joint, every weak well, they find every hole that's been caused by life and the elements and everything else. And they, they will sand that thing back down. They will get all the rust removed. Yes, they'll do the whole uh, Bondo thing if they have to. But most of the time, man, they've got these guys who are just skilled in, in making it look like if they use Bondo at all, you never even know that they used it. But they go in and they find every weak place and every weak joint and, every, and they are bringing it back to... Floors, I mean, to spectacular condition. And sometimes it takes a long time. And sometimes it just takes moments. But the point of restoration is, is, is not that you tell him where to start. It's that you let him start wherever he wants. And that you say, I, 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 I am an open book. Read me, find me, see me, and restore me. Because that's what I want. That's what I need. I, and this is, this is how he does it. He does it with grace. What, is the, what does Paul say about grace? He says, my grace is sufficient for you because my strength is made perfect or complete in weakness. So the best thing you can do is be completely transparent to him, knowing that when he sees the weakness, he fills it with grace. So that his strength builds up your weakness and he takes you back to spectacular condition the process is rough it's taking the rough areas out it's allowing God to speak and to tell you where those weaknesses are so that you can give them over to the father it's it it, it is awesome and painful and wonderful all in the same and thank God that he is patient with us the entire time But it's not only that he restores, because the verse continues. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You see, while while we see that he restores, the second part of this verse tells me how he restores. It tells me how he restores. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Remember that last week we said, we, we defined the word lead to be sustain. Now, do you know what sustain means? Let me tell you, I'm glad you didn't know. According to Webster, to cause to continue or to be prolonged for an extended period without interruption. In other words, when it says that he leads me or he sustains as of righteousness, it's an uninterrupted condition. It's an uninterrupted, it is, it is without any, uh, 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 it is without any lack. So it goes all the way back to that first verse, I lack nothing. Well, you lack nothing because he provides it all. And in his provision, it is an extended period without interruption. So can I say it this way? The only reason that you feel interrupted in your relationship with God is not because of God. It's because you stopped the process. It's because you made the interruption. It's not because God did, because he sustains uninterruptedly. He sustains us in paths of righteousness. Now, God sustains you in the right standing direction in life. That word path means direction in life. And he sustains you in directions in life in the right path or being in the right place. How does he do that? Again, he does that through Jesus. He does it. Through Jesus. Listen, in the 21st century, if we in the church can't figure out that it's not our programs that does anything. 
okay? When you say that we need another program, don't say that. We don't need another program. We need Jesus to fill up the programs we got. We need, which means we need a whole lot more of Jesus than we do a program. I like the things that we do, but if Jesus is not at the center of them, we don't need to do them. Does that make sense? The ultimate right standing is not right doing. It's right being. And being in Christ is the right way. You see, it's more than just saying, I believe. It's having the conviction that Jesus is Lord and believing in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and allowing the Holy Spirit to walk out the whole life of Christ in you and overtake you, consuming your heart, setting your feet right in him and standing firmly on the life that he lives through and in you. How does he restore me? How does he restore me in paths of righteousness? He shows me Jesus. He leads me in Jesus. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, the paths of righteousness does not mean that we're all on a separate journey on a different path. Because let me tell you, we're all on the same journey. And if the journey is Christ likeness, then we can't have we can have more than one stage in the journey, but it's not separate journeys. Now understand, that doesn't mean that, I, that, uh, that we don't all go through different things on the journey. But what it does mean is that if there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, it's one journey. Okay, But he leads me in direction for life through righteousness. Through right standing, which is found in Christ Jesus. And those paths of righteousness, those directions of life are... All along the same place, because what, 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 what do we sing? We, we've sung some of these old songs. Uh, he's, he's saving me, keeping me from all sin and shame. Wonderful is my Redeemer, praise his name. What does he do? He heals. How does he do that? He comes into your life at the restoration stage and says, here's the harm, here's the hurt, here's how we can fix it. You need Jesus. And he says, here, let me show you Jesus. And you go, oh, Jesus. And the blood of Jesus comes in and the healing power of Jesus comes in and the, the faith of the one who loves me and gave himself for me comes in. And all of these things begin to be restored in my life. The paths are just moments along the journey. Stations, if you will. Recurring stations. Because we don't all get healed all at once. Because it's one thing heals, another thing reveals. Isn't that, isn't that true? Anybody ever gone through a, through a healing in themselves uh, and, and you go, oh, this area got healed in my life and I'm so happy. And then all of a sudden something else gets, something else raises up and you go, I had no idea that was there. Well, that's because that's another, that's, a, that's, a, that's another station of healing that you're going through on the journey into Christ's likeness. So how does, he, how does he do this? He says, let me show you my son. Isn't it interesting that when uh, God is speaking to Moses in the, burn, in the burning bush, he says, he says, listen, they've only known me. They've only known me as Elohim, which is almighty. They've never known me as this name. Do you know that God doesn't start revealing himself in relationship to Israel until after they've been delivered from slavery? It's, it's not until they cross the Red Sea that he goes from Elohim to Jehovah. He doesn't, he doesn't reveal himself as any other name because he says they only knew me by this name. They only knew me by this level of character, the almighty, the creator, the all-powerful one. This is who they knew me as. But in this revelation of, restor uh, of relationship and restoration to who I've called them to be, because in Israel's case, he was calling them back to the relationship that he had with Abraham. And what was Abraham? The Bible says that he was called the friend of God. So he, in restoring them back to that place, he now reveals himself in character. Steps of the way, he's Jehovah Jireh, my provider, Jehovah 
uh, Rophe, my, uh, Rapha, my healer. Jehovah Sidkenu, he's my righteousness. He's, uh, uh, he is uh, uh, Jehovah, yeah, my banner. He is, he is, there, we've done the study of the names before. I think there's like, there's like 10 or 12. And, and so offhand, he begins to reveal himself in these moments on the journey of friendship. He reveals himself so that you can begin to trust him in those areas of your life and relationship with him. It's in the same way with Jesus. He's restoring us to the path of Jesus. But in order to look like Jesus, you can't look like you. We, we can't look like, we, we, no, sorry. You don't get, you, you may, uh, Jason may forever look like Jason. But the whole point of people looking at Jason is to see past this so that Jesus is presented. Right. They say, oh, I, I see Jesus in you. Well, okay, I, I want you to see Jesus instead of me. Oh, that touched on a nerve. I, I don't want you to see me. I want you to see Jesus instead of me. So I'm going to go through this process of healing. I'm going to go through this process of wholeness. I'm going to go through this process of, of, of shame being removed and hurt being removed and guilt being removed and all of these things. And it's all provided by the blood of Jesus. It's all provided the deeper relationship I go with Jesus. Doesn't it sound like, like the formula for the church today is, is it, while we love the lights and the technos and, and, and all of that stuff, we love all of that. Listen, if you want to make disciples, teach Jesus. If you want to bring the community to the core, teach Jesus. If you want to just have entertainment value, focus on everything else. The last several weeks, it just feels like the, the same conclusion. I could probably have summed all of Psalm 23 up uh, with, with one message, and it would be simply this, Jesus. Uh, can, can I tell you, I could preach the entire Bible to you, and you know what it would say? Jesus. You know, I, I could break down the Old Testament. I could tell you everything about the Hebrew and show, and, and show you that it's still going to reveal one person, Jesus. I, I could break down the New Testament and tell you everything that's ever said in the New Testament and how the acts of the apostles is based on the gospel that was presented in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as a part of their lives that they were living. And everything that's written in a letter is based on that moment in Acts where they experienced Jesus and Jesus brought the Holy Spirit and changed their lives completely and the world has never been the same since. The Bible's a very simple book if you you will just read it and understand it. But it all boils back down to what did God want to do when he gave us the written word? He wanted us to read about and then get to know personally Jesus. He's always been leading us in this place. So preaching self-help is no good. But preaching Jesus' help is all good. And so I, I want you to understand how does he restore me? He restores me in Deeper connection and revelation with Jesus. And when I read the Bible, I, I cannot forget it's the, it's the moment that, will, that, it, that wrecked me for the rest of my life. This was eight years ago. Eight years ago. It's the annual 21-day fast that we did. And by the way, um, sometimes we get away from things because they become fad instead of faith. All right? So we had this 21-day fast, and man, it was the first time that I had ever been like, okay, I've done Daniel's, Daniel fast for a long time. You know, just, uh, that's, just go out in the front yard and eat the mowed grass and drink some water. You're going to be all right. I mean, it's, 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 it's about that level of, of, of a fast, you know. It's like, oh, okay, I can do this. But then I would, I would realize that, that, that by the end of those 21 days, what am I going to do? We're going to have a great, big, nasty feast in which we're going to eat everything that is not good for us as a church. And we're going to all go home sick and have to pray for healing for the next week because we've almost killed ourselves eating things that we did not eat for 21 days. And so it's like, okay, well, I'm going to go hardcore because, you know, if you're going to go hardcore, you, it's water only. You don't even do juice. No coffee, nothing, water. I remember. Oh, now that's just, that's religion, by the way. I'm just going to say that. That's religion. But I'm on there and, and I'm in this 21-day fast and I'm drinking water and, and, you know, it's just wonderful. But as I'm, I'm reading 
I'm, I'm, I'm reading the word. Every time I would get hungry, I would read the word. Every time I would get thirsty for something other than water, I would read, word, read the word. I was filling myself up with the word. And I remember I was getting down to, I was getting down to like the Last Supper area. And I, um, I think I was probably in John, you know, he's the disciple that Jesus loved. And, I, uh, and I'm sitting there and I'm reading. And I kid you not, it was the most breathtaking moment I've ever had. Because the moment I started to hear, to read Jesus speaking, it was like I was sitting at the table. And I could hear him speak. And I wept. Because I wasn't reading the Bible. I, I, I was like, it was like in the moment, it was like, God, is this even possible? It's not something you tell people, I had an out-of-body experience. I had an out-of-time and body experience. I was whisked away back to the Last Supper. You know, people are like, you're weird. But to say that here I am and I'm hearing this voice in my head and I'm, I'm reading these words of Jesus and it's like he's saying them to me. And from that point forward, I've never been the same because I, I went into a next level of relationship with him. The process of restoring my soul, I'd done fast before. I've read the Bible. It's, I was in Bible quiz forever. It's, it's, it was, you know, uh, I've, I'm about as assemblies of God to the bone as you can possibly get in being involved in every program we've ever done. All right, so, uh, and so just in this moment, there was just this new level of intimacy with the word of God that allowed me to see Jesus the way God intended me to see Jesus. See, he doesn't want you to just read about him. That's why Paul says, this is, Paul says, this is eternal life. Isn't it funny that he doesn't say eternal life is dancing on streets of gold up there in the sky with, with God. He says, this is eternal life that I may know him. Amen. That I may know him. How does he restore you? He gets you to wanting to know him. He gets you to that deeper place of wanting to know him. And so as a shepherd does with his sheep, as, as David is writing this in the same sense, then this means that he understands that in order for me to get into the right place with God, he's restoring me by, by bringing me back to the place uh, that was before I left. But how does he do it? He introduces me in deeper levels of intimacy to the shepherd. And that means that he's willing to find me where I'm at. To pick me up and to speak to me as he calms every fear, his hand going over every pain that I may have endured as I have wandered away from him, finding everything to make sure that I'm okay and what needs to be done in order to restore me to the place of when he calls my name, I run to him and him only. But he's willing to take time. Ladies and gentlemen, he's willing to take time with you. If you really want to know the depths of discipleship with the Lord, take your time plan and throw it away. Because we are not on the microwave edition of relationship with the Father. He wants to take time and spend it with you so that you know him the way he wants to be known. And if you will surrender your time frame, Lord, I'm going to be redeemed by 2023, restored by the middle of 2023, ready for everlasting life by Christmas of 2023, so that in 2024, I can begin to move the way you want me to move. And then guess what happens? The enemy goes, oh, I heard that. Strife in your marriage. Strife with your kids. Strife at work. Sickness. Hurt. Disgruntled pains. 
all of these things. He's like, okay, fine. You think you've got a timeline? I'm going to become the monkey in the wrench. So that you're what? Thrown off your timeline. <gasps> and then we just give up. I'm just going to stay at this level right here because it's the only thing that I guess I'm good enough for. Ladies and gentlemen, just remember, while you weren't good enough for where you started in relationship with God, you were still always good enough for Jesus to die for you. And so it doesn't matter where you care, whether you think you were good enough, if you'll get rid of your time frame, and just let the shepherd love the sheep. Let the, she let, let the father begin to reveal Jesus. What is that going to mean for you? What, what really is that going to mean for you? That's going to mean dig deeper than the five-minute Devo that you listen to on KVE. I love KVE, but they are not going to get me into a deeper relationship with Jesus. I love Lisa Turkhurst. I pray that God brings healing to her for everything that she's been through. But ladies and gentlemen, 30-second sound bites of Lisa Turkhurst are not making a disciple out of you. Digging into the Word of God, asking questions, finding answers, trusting God to lead you in the path as you are digging into the Word. Being here as much as you possibly can to engage corporately in worship. Having a life of worship and not just worshiping when you think that you should come to church to do it. Having a personal relationship with God that goes beyond your attendance levels at the church. We, we, we've got to, uh, you know, keeping attendance is only good if we want to look good to those guys that are, at the, that are at the district offices. Some of you will understand what I'm talking about there. But I'm not in it for the numbers. Numbers will come when disciples are being made. So I, ch I challenge you with this, ladies and gentlemen. It's, it's, and, and while I give you this thumbnail idea, I want you to, as I, to, to, to close with this. Notice the last thing that David says here in this verse. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I, 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 I don't want to burst your bubble, but folks, it ain't about you. Can, can, can I be honest? Most of you know that there's a second verse in the third song that we sang. Most of you know that it's always about the army rising up to break every chain. I, I, I've been wanting to do this song for a week. We did it Wednesday night, and it was good. But I've been wanting to do it on this. Do, do, I, I really felt like we needed to do it. And as I was thinking about this song, I was like, you know what? Second verse. Why? Because it's not about me. And, and can I be honest and tell you that the, the songs that we do that are about me miss the point of Psalm 23.3. Because, because I, I need you to hear this. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. In, in other words, he will make a better you, but it's not to make just a better you. It's to make a bigger him. Amen. It's him that matters. You want God to do all of these great things in your life. Awesome. Know this. It's not so you can walk around and go, yeah, yeah, you know, I did this and I did this and this is how I did it. And this is what I was doing. And this is what I was thinking when I did it. It's so that you can be like Paul who said, I was the least of all saints. I, 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 I killed the church believing I was doing this for God and country and all of this. And, and, and I realized that I wasn't doing it. I was doing it all wrong. And so I'm the least of all saints. And then he says this, but God still was patient with me, not so that my name could be made big, but so everybody could glory in him seeing what he could do with a person like me. Ladies and gentlemen, you are in the relationship with God so that everyone else can see how good God is, not seeing how good you are. 
You can quote all of the Bible backwards and forwards. I knew a guy in Bible quiz who memorized the book of Romans and could quote it backwards, word for word backwards. It wasn't very impressive until he did it. And then it was like a one-time impressive thing. It was like, oh, you wasted your time. When are you ever going to use that? Let me tell you what the book of Romans says backwards. <laughs> like a country song in reverse. You gain everything instead of losing everything. Never mind. <laughs> God, forgive me. I am at the most serious part of the message, and here I am just clowning. I'm sorry, you know what I'm talking about. The, the whole point is, is he, you're not doing it. He's not doing it for you. He's doing it for him. When, when I walk through and I see what God has done in Jack, I'm not thankful for Jack sticking with it. I knew he would. I'm praising God because I can see what God can do in him. When I look at some of you and I'm like, oh my God, to see what God has done in you, it is impressive. I don't have to walk around and go, yeah, it was because of my preaching that they're, they are the way they are. No, it's because God took this mouth and made change in someone's life. God did it. And when you stand before God, you can't stand there and go, oh, well, all I know is, is that I did this and I did this and I did this. It would be like, no, I thank you that you did this. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. That's awesome. But the life I live. And, and, and really, it's not even that. It's I'm crucified with Christ. But yet it is. Christ in me that's living. And the life that I live, it's not even my life anymore. It's Jesus alive in me, and it's by the faith of the one who loved me and gave himself for me. So not only did he save me and set me free, he made sure that me dies so that he can live and so that he can live in me by giving me the faith that he had from the very beginning. Because he loves me and gave himself for me. And so all glory goes to God in my life. I know where I'm at because of God. I know the doors that I've walked through because of God. I, I know the, the person that God is making in me because he's so good. And, geez, and he has given me greater revelation of Jesus for his name's sake. You are a walking billboard of the power of God. In that sense, you're all like Job. I close with this. Finally close. You're all like Job. The Bible says very clearly, God called the angels to present themselves. And they all go. Satan ends up going. Listen, I've heard the arguments. The fact that Satan was in the presence of God lets you know that Satan can go into the presence of God. He's still an angel that has to give account. He's still submitted whether you believe it or not. He presented himself. And isn't it funny that the accuser of the brethren, standing in front of God, presenting himself, and the first thing that God says is, where you been? Oh, I've been roaming to and fro. Just kind of wandering what you gave me. And out of everybody else, God says, have you seen my boy Job? There is no one like him because he's allowed the process of restoration and paths of righteousness to develop him into a place where he needs to be with me. God wants us all to get to the place where if Satan ever presents himself and he says, where you been? Well, I'm walking around the earth. Have you seen my Mary Ann? Nobody like her. She's one in a million, one in a trillion, one in a quadrillion. I don't know how many people are here. Have you, have you, have you seen my boy Clinton? Yeah, no one like him. But we're not supposed to be individuals. Only in this moment can he call you by name and still see his son. That's how you know. When he says, have you seen my, my son? 
Have you seen my daughter? Well, I see Jesus. Yeah, but, but have you seen him? That's where we can all be. That's where I want to be. So stand with me this morning.